So Chris has uh, been working as a, an independent artist, and uh, independent is the word for Chris, right, Chris? And um, uh, he's, he's been, been successful at this. And so we're going to talk to him today about the, some of the, the issues of his career and how he sees it and what he needs and that kind of thing. So, um, and we will open it to questions. If you have a question, please come to that mic and feel free to ask it. So Chris, t tell me about that, um, what you've been doing recently. I heard you told me you were working, doing film scoring. How'd you have that happen? It's something I'd always wanted to do. And um, I got introduced to film and music through music videos. So uh, early on, I was, um, you know, the record company would hire, you know, a video director, set a budget, you go make a music video. And uh, I was really green about film and stuff like that. but. After making a few videos that I thought were way over budget and not, I wasn't really happy with the results. Uh, I started, uh, you know, the last few things that I did. This is like mid '90s or so. I started getting more involved and and you know directing some music videos and and kind of storyboarding my own ideas, so to speak. And you mentioned Old Brother Wartha. By the time that I got a phone call from the makers of that movie, the producers of that film, asking me to read uh, the script from the Coen brothers. I had been hoping to, there we go, I had been hoping to um, get involved in film and thinking that in order to do that I would have to go out and see the Louisiana, you know, Philharmonic Orchestra and learn how to write music for the oboes and the French horns and, and all of these kinds of instruments. and. Uh, because my background is blues, which is you're dealing with mostly just the rhythm instruments. And um, come to find out, you know, my big, my big debut scoring a movie in Hollywood, so to speak, was just doing some old Del some Delta blues that I picked up, you know, <laughs> back in Baton Rouge at my dad's jig joint. You know, it's like no uh, cellos, anything, nothing fancy, no sheet music. You know, just just pure, um, just a pure score of uh, of. Um, 1930s blues, so so you never know. It's good to be prepared, but I was thinking, um, and I was also not aiming as high as major motion pictures. I was hoping for like, you know, student film or independent film at a film festival that time. Didn't work out, did it? Well, you know, I'm not complaining. Yeah. So how did you get the part with in Scorsese's film, the the blues uh, series that he did? Well, once you have uh, some success. Uh, especially, you know, there's some movies you can be in. You can be in a movie, um, like, uh, I, I won't name names, I just said like a real bad B movie. And, you know, it's a movie, okay, you know, but then, uh, and it might have some success, but then a lot of the real um, movies and shakers, say, in Hollywood, won't see that film. Uh, you find yourself in a Coen Brothers film working with, you know, George Clooney and John Turturro and really fine actors like that, you know, film score by, um, by uh, you know, one of Hollywood's, um, you know, most talented guys, um, T-Bone Burnett. Then everybody come and see your film. Steven Spielberg, Scorsese, all these people are fans of each other, so they see each other's film. So if you're in one of those films, or if you have music in a film like that, it's great exposure. So after, after that, I, got, I just simply got another call from uh, ben Venders, who directed The Soul of a Man, a film you're referring to, it was produced by Scorsese. And uh, I played Blind Willie Johnson in that, in that film, and it debuted at the Cannes Film Festival and uh, was theatrically released outside of America. Uh, in America, it, it aired on, uh, on television. And I also got a call from, um, well, I didn't get a call, actually. I went and visited uh, uh, I'm real bad with names. I went and visited um, the director of Ray and um, Taylor Hackford. Taylor Hackford, right? And uh, had a meeting with him about doing some scoring for the movie Ray, which I got a chance to work with Ray Charles at his studio and did the score there, and um, and got cast as Lowell Folsom, the band leader, you know, for the movie Ray. So, and then you do a movie like that, and other people see that movie, and and work begets work, you know. Mm -hmm. So how did all this affect your, your music career? Well, um, you know, being a blues artist, you know, you probably, everybody here probably heard of B.B. King. 
But I mean, I think this guy played like every club in, a, in the world and you know, on Mars, you know, at least 50, 60 yeah. times. I mean, there's no part of the planet he hasn't been to and haven't performed, you know, countless of times. So um, I think it's fed up the thing, whereas a box office movie, you know, the first weekend, you know, you know, several million people are going out to see a movie. And I so happen to be playing characters that do music as well as acting, which is a great uh, combination for me. And you reach millions of people that it would take me, if I had to play clubs, the club circuit to do that, it would take me maybe 50 years, if I'm lucky, you know, mm -hmm. with, all, with, the, with, with, with all the luck in the world to reach that many people that you reach on a weekend with mm -hmm. a motion picture. So I think that the motion picture, you know, is kind of one of the highest uh, forms of art that we have in our society right now. And, and it definitely is, is uh, a way to reach a lot of people. Did you have any publishing interest in any of those films? Um, any songs? No, um, what, because, those, because those movies were, those films that we just talked about, and I've done other things. I've done a movie called Animal, which starred Bing Rames and Terrence Howard. Uh, and that movie, um, I, I did the whole score, and it was an independent release, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, I own the, the the soundtrack to that, and uh, and music supervised it, meaning that you choose all the music and things. But in these other movies, Ray, your brother, um, the Scorsese piece, those were period films, so mm -hmm. they were using music from the period, and you know, obviously, I'm not from that period, mm -hmm. so. I, I, it doesn't mean I didn't try to suggest that we could <laughs> throw something in there. Did you? Are you signed to a major company now? Not, not at no, not at the moment. Are you trying to be signed to a major company? Well, I'm distributed by, um, you know, I guess you could call it major distribution, but. But you, you run, you have your own label, your own, own imprint. Yeah, my label is called 21st Century Blues Records, and um, it's it's uh, I'm, I own the label. And uh, I'm distributed um, through Ry Ryko, which is owned by um, Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. WIA. And, um, and di digitally, you know, iTunes and all these other places, AOL and just about it. I can't even, I don't even know all the digital outlets, but mm -hmm. worldwide distribution um, through all those sources as well. Well, how did you make the jump from growing up in your dad's club in Baton Rouge and being a local musician to being a successful entrepreneur, what what was the first step? How did you just you just went on the road? I mean, how did it how did it work? I think yeah, I think that's the first step is just kind of stepping out of the nest, so to speak. You know, just you know, I left home as a teenager, moved to Austin, Texas, and uh, and kind of you know got involved with the scene there, and um, you know, I, when I when I was you know to make try to condense a long story to short. Uh, I started out, you know, like very young, you know, uh, eight, nine years old, ten years old, playing uh, not only with my dad but with other Louisiana, you know, blues musicians like Henry Gray and and uh, a lot of guys who aren't even around anymore. And uh, started out playing with those guys and recording with them, you know. Uh, even had a stint where I actually played with the guy I played in Ray. I used to play. I did a tour with um, Low Folson as a bag of guitars and. Uh, Joe Tex, I played, used to play when I was about 13 years old, and I did, did dates with him. And I was just like a little guy, you know, who people would take me on, the, on gigs with him. And Joe Tex was really cool because he did all the tricks with the microphone, and then I'd do some tricks and play the guitar with my teeth and, and all this kind of stuff here. So we had a nice little circus act, you know. But <laughs> I uh, started very young, and then I started making my own records uh, under my own name. Um, and my first record came out in 86 uh, called The Beginning uh, with our Hooli Records. What well, our original title was It's a Cold Ass World, but they didn't want to name it that, so they named it The Beginning. Oh, I see. Yeah. And we did a couple of records together, and at that point you were just beginning to, to re release your first record, wasn't that true? Or you on, on, my, on my label, you yeah. mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, before, yeah, when you and I got together and did some things, um, some compilation albums, which were, you know, uh, great experiences for me, I might add. And uh, we, uh, before that though, you know, my first record came out with Arhuli Records, a little small independent label. 
probably more famous for guys like Clifton Chenier and um, Lightning Hopkins. And not a commercial driven label. And they didn't record me for commercial reasons. Uh, Nick Spitzer, who some of you guys might have heard of, he was a folklorist at the Smithsonian Institute at the time in the uh, early 80s. And, and he was in Louisiana doing some work. And he heard me, met me, and he wrote to Chris Drakwich and said, um, you know, that he should record me. Not so much record me because I was going to, you know, be an MTV, you know, success or something, but record me in the old fashioned way as document what I was doing because it was inter interesting and new and, you know, kind of culturally he thought, you know, kind of important and should be documented. And that's how, and then Chris Drackers wrote to me saying if I had enough songs for an album that, you know, we, uh, that he would like to release it. And I didn't at the time, but I told him yes. And, um, you know, he sent me a check for like 600 bucks and I recorded a record. And, uh, you know, and that kind of started my journey. But I think I was probably one of the last, you know, blues artists of, to get recorded that way, like through a folklorist or just as a documentation. I don't think, you know, well now that doesn't happen anymore. I was probably the last guy to have a folklorist kind of advocate that you should be, that what you're doing should be documented. And, um, but since that, I went on to record for, as far as major labels, um, I recorded, I signed up, you know, what was at then a pretty substantial deal with Warner Brothers uh, in 1990 and um, ended up working with labels like RCA and uh, a few other major labels. I can't remember them all. Scotty Brothers at one point. And after going through all of that, I decided that I would start my own production company and take a little bit more control um, of my creative, you know, presentation. And that's how 21st Century Blues came about. Well, you uh, And that was mid-90s when I first released my first thing. Do you, do you feel a certain obligation to the tradition of your music? I mean, you mentioned you were the last of the, to be recorded by the folklorist. I mean, does that give you some sort of responsibility? Or are you just trying to make the music that's in your, in your head? Well, I'm trying to, you know, I mean, I don't uh, try to, you know, I don't pigeonhole myself creatively. I don't think that in, in those terms. And at the time that all these things happened, I wasn't aware if he was a folklorist or anything. I didn't huh. know anything about, I didn't even know what the Smithsonian was. You, know? you were just doing what you do. I had never even heard of our holy records. You know, these are things after I've been around the world a few times and I look back at, you know, my um, beginnings, uh, I realize that every kid don't grow up in a jig joint, you know? <laughs> and, you know, every kid isn't out in, in bars till three and four in the morning, you know, when they're 12, 13 years old, and those things aren't normal. and. But that's my background and that's that's my upbringing. But the um, the other part of it too is that um, because I started playing with these guys as a young kid, and my name would appear on records as a rhythm guitar player or you know a songwriter or a drummer or whatever it might have been on these different sessions. By the time I decided, okay, well I want to make a record and this is the kind of music I want to do. I was already, you know, people had used, had read liner notes and had already put me in a certain box that I didn't even, you know, realize that there were boxes, you know. But um, that's why my music was so controversial early on because I was trying to play the music that I felt in my heart, you know, of hearts and uh, trying to express myself real honestly and creatively and everything. And then other people have these concepts about what a uh, a blues guy from Louisiana should be doing, or the son of a blues man should be doing, or you know, everybody's already got these expectations that I'm I don't understand these expectations and I'm not trying to live up to them. And uh, so it was pretty easy to be controversial when you don't fit, you know, you're trying to fit a round hole in a square pig. It's just, you know, there's gonna be some friction. Well, you're the first uh, first guy I met that was combining hip hop with the genre of music that you grew up with. How did that work out for you? Um, I think it worked as artistically. I think it worked um, it worked pretty well artistically. But you know, you go down and you chop down all the trees, and then you know, I'd rather be I'd rather let somebody else chop down those trees and be mm -hmm. the pioneer, and I just kind of cruise on through yeah. 
in a chauffeur limo or something. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be. But you know, those roads needed to be uh, paved, and uh, somebody had to do it. So. Well, you did do it. So, how, who took care of your business? How did you learn about the business? Uh, I didn't learn about the business as much as uh, I mean, the guys I, I you know, the guys that 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 nobody sat around and really gave me any music lessons and. You know, nobody sat around with me and told me, you know, this is how you do things. It was more, this is what you don't do. Hmm. So most of the old blues guys, I mean, they, even if they had hit records, I mean, they didn't get paid. And they knew every shady trick and all the, you know. And you get a lot of bad advice. You know, a lot of, a lot of advice that will just, can't pay any attention to some of these guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> because they'll lead you into all kinds of trouble. But. Um, these guys, every hard luck story, I already knew all the hard luck stories, and I already knew all the traps and things that a lot of, uh, you know, artists fall into. Now, there's some things, obviously, you know, I didn't know about because the business is constantly evolving, but I didn't know what to do as, as, as much as what not to do. And um, just little things like, um, you know, as far as success in a business, you know, the first thing is that you gotta copyright your work. You know, you need to, to, um, you know, take, be involved, you know, in your um, business activities and not just, you know, you get a lot of advice, well, you just worry about the music and your manager's gonna worry about the management. And um, you can't really do that. You have to, you know, there's certain simple rules where you just have, you have to sign your own checks you have to, uh, you know, try try your best to understand that it's more of a business um, than it is um, about the music. I mean, the music is such a small percentage hmm. of what I do now, and um, which is kind of unfortunate. You know, that that's something I didn't realize until later. But it's really um, it's almost all business and very little music these days. Isn't that interesting, huh? It's it's, it how do you deal with that? I mean, do you you just spend like six hours a day on your business and then try to write music after that or play music or what? How do you balance yourself? Well, I go weeks and months without picking up an instrument. Is that know? right? Yeah. And uh, I almost never pick up the guitar. I don't know if I should be saying that to everybody, but, but I spend, I mean, my instrument seem to be a computer, you know I mean? <laughs> I mean I'm like, uh, you know, that's kind of where everything happens, you know? I mean, a day in the life for me, like today, I'm, they gave everybody in New Orleans until the 18th of October to, to do the taxes. So, you know, um, I'm on the phone with support from QuickBooks trying to get my network set up to catch back up on my books from last year, which was lost in the flood and these kinds of things, and uh, trying to hire an accountant in the new town that I live in. And it's, um, it's a never ending uh, administrative situation which you can I complain about it and I don't like it but I have to do it because you know if you don't do it then somebody else would do it for you mm -hmm. and um, and believe me somebody else would do it for mm -hmm. you so it's important to um, I mean it's a business you know so you have to prepare and um, especially now that I run a record label and I'm you know I just can't make a I just can't worry about okay I made a good record well, I'm the pres president of the label, you know. I got to come up with a marketing plan. I got to, I got to set budgets, and I have to hire, you know, independent publicists and and radio promoters, and uh, I have to make sure that my sales people out there, you know, uh, getting it in stores, and that the ads are bought and designed, and and the new in the magazines and all that kind of stuff, you know, which is a whole lot of fun, you know what I mean? You have a my face page. I, I do. I, I have one, but I didn't put it up. A fan, I think, did it. I don't even know how to do MySpace, you know. We can hook you up. Yeah, I, I think I got some MySpaces out there, but I don't know who put them up, and I don't have minister, and I don't know nothing about that part of it. I mean, I used to. I mean, I know how to design a website, you know. Um, I have the software, you know. Um, I got these he heavily powered Macs, and I used to be very involved, and it was. I made it a point that a website was kind of an extension of the artist, meaning that artists, I'm, I'm, I'm talking light years ago, you know, like five years ago, I mean, um, which is light years and in internet uh, time, but it's like artists, um, 
I felt that my website should be an extension of me, meaning that I should have a personal involvement in it and that, um, you know, your design and all your, every, your whole layout was kind of like, like doing an album cover, where you used to have big album covers and stuff. And the uh, internet is kind of an extension of that, you know, that's the way I, I looked at it. So I, thought, I took it upon myself to be involved, to understand it, to design it as much as I could and be hands-on with it, answer every email. And uh, then when you start getting more success and stuff, you just can't do it. I, I find that I can't really uh, answer. Uh, very rarely do I answer fan email, and uh, you know, because I, I have to deal with so many, you know, things on the business end as far as email go and stuff. And um, I can't monitor. Uh, I can't really keep up. You know, I got videos on, I think what they call YouTube or whatever. But believe me, like next year, MySpace will be like history. You know, it'll be something else. So I, um, I, don't, I don't get too uh, locked into the technology because I understand now that it's going to constantly evolve. And as soon as uh, one thing becomes very, uh, once the, corp once the corporate uh, companies buy it up, it's kind of already on the way out at that mm -hmm. point. You know, it's kind of, they kind of buy it to get it out of the way mm -hmm. and do away with it as, uh, as kind of competition or whatever. And, uh, and then they move up to the next thing and, and gobble that up. The one thing that um, I think is gonna be here for a while is iTunes, because iTunes is, um, it's not just some, some mavericks, you know, in their garage who came up with an idea. Well, they did start that way, but I mean, this is a company that um, they're at the cutting edge of not only everything that's happening in movies, you know, but iPods and the way music is distributed and the whole thing. So, I mean, it's not just one um, website or software idea that somebody came up with. There's a whole, you know, mm -hmm. su support thing around that. And um, so, um, you know, that's something that you have to wrestle with. There was a lot of bands and a lot of artists who said that they weren't going to sell the music on iTunes, like Metallica and other people. Beatles. The Beatles. And now they are, they're, they're, now they're, they have to join the party, you know. They might just. You read about the Beatles recently suing EMI. They're suing their record company after what, 40 years? And for what? I haven't heard. For of not that. paying royalties. Really? <laughs> so if the Beatles can't get paid, then what hope do the rest of us have? There you go. There so you go. There, in this in this room, there are, there are um, young musicians who are actually performing and playing and trying to have a career and probably de are determined to have it. What advice would you offer to them? Well, um, how many people are, act, are mu planning to pursue as, to pursue this as musicians? I'll get it, Chris. Any musicians in the audience? Mm -hmm. and, and how many plan to pursue music um, and other careers like management or the technical side? Or, and I guess, I guess the musicians, some, how many musicians slash plan to be musician incorporated out there. Um, yeah, I think that I would say the first thing that, you know, I, I think chapter one in your career, you know, music career, should be define your goals and decide what it is that you want out of it, what you want to accomplish. And then, uh, and then, try to find, you know, the road to accomplish that goal. If your goal is to be, you know, rich and famous, um, then that's a, that might be a whole different path than to be a great musician, you know, because it seems to me these days that, that unfortunately, the, 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 the more, um, you know, uh, seems to me these days that being a, a musician who have studied all the, the classic music and you know somebody who is uh, brilliant on their instrument. I I don't think the music business really have uh, business as we know it today. Don't have much use for a musician that is so um, that is so deep, you know, musically. And uh, so I think that the first thing that you have to do is define your goals, what you want out of it. If you want to be a a, a great musician and make some great music. Uh, and not necessarily be famous or, you know, these other things that come with it, you know, then, um, 
that's attainable. You know, you can control that. You know, you can dedicate yourself. You can uh, find resources and find inspiration and, and things to achieve those goals. But if you want to be, you know, quote unquote famous, then that's a whole nother, a whole nother thing, which uh, someone like myself, you know, probably couldn't advise you on, you know, all these different aspects. But, you know, you'd have to seek advice, you know, from people who do what it is you, you're setting out to try to achieve. If you want to make money and be, uh, if success to you is defined by, you know, uh, by uh, some kind of uh, financial, if financial success is important, meaning like, I use two examples, like Britney Spears, you know, she's from around these, these parts. And Britney Spears, you know, has made more money than she can probably count in the music business. And, uh, but, you know, people don't hold her in high regard as a, as a musician, as an artist. And, uh, you know, and it's an eye to behold her, really, or the ear to behold her. But um, that's one thing that you can, you know, you can be very, you know, if you're going to be in the business, you know, you're going to have to figure out what's selling, what's hot, what's trendy. Jump on those trends, whether you're in management or whether you're an artist, you know, and you have to ride that wave until that wave peters out. Um, and, you know, it's just different ways to go about that. And if you're going to be a musician who, uh, you know, just I'll use a jazz musician as an example, you know, you might be uh, very well respected among your peers, but, you know, what that might be, 35 people or something, you know. <laughs> So uh, it's hard to make a living doing that. You end up maybe playing it in, in, you know, as background music in restaurants and stuff, you know, and you're a very accomplished musician or a singer or whatever. And so if you're happy, if that's the kind of music you want to do, then that is success for you, is that you found a way to make a living, you know, doing what it is that you love to do. And that's really, uh, uh, really successful, being, being successful as opposed to being a, uh, a marketing person, a business person running some label, a major label, or a real successful label financially, and, uh, and, and your whole day is spent not with music, but with reports and, and sound scans and data and, and all these kinds of things. It's like you, could, you might as well be selling shoes or any other kind of product, you know, because you don't even have time to listen to music if you pursue that. But, you know, um, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I'm just saying that the two don't, they don't naturally go together. Do you, um, I mean, you talk about the importance of goals. Uh, what's your goal? And what, how do you expect to get there? How do you take yourself to the next level? Um, well, these days, I mean, I guess my first uh, years, you know, I didn't even see it as a business. And I, you know, I had, you know, I was total anti, um, you know, I had, I had like uh, dreadlocks, you know, down my butt when they were like, I was the only guy going through airports getting frisked. You Come know? to think of it, you yeah, were. Yeah. They used to frisk me, man. They see me coming a mile away. Yeah. I've been taking off my shoes and stripping at airports <laughs> for 20 years, you know. I'm just happy to see everybody else going, <laughs> yeah. you know. So, but um, I, you know, you know, and things about when you're being independent, you know, meaning that you go to a bank and you try to get a loan to, to you know, to, um, you know, um, invest in your business or invest in yourself in some kind of way. And they, you know, um, some years ago, you know, that was very uh, unusual. Whereas now, if you work from home, it's actually legitimate now. You know, there's all kinds of banking institutions where when you say, when they say, well, you know, where, where do you work? You say, you know, I work for myself and I work in my pajamas all day, you know, from home. That's totally legitimate, you know. I mean, they'll say, well, how much do you need? And, you know, you just do this such and such and such and such. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, it's a lot easier now as far as the support mechanisms to uh, invest in your business or to get yourself off the ground. And even if you're a musician, you got to have an instrument. You got to have somewhere to rehearse. You got to have somewhere to create. You got to have equipment to do these things. You gotta have a van or whatever to go out and play gigs. You gotta, you know, you gotta uh, invest in marketing materials or some uh, computer or software. I mean, you, you, need, you need capital. You need to start up, you need startup money. You need an investor or somebody to believe in you or you need to be able to go to a bank and say, hey, this is what I do when I need, you know, a little bit of money to get started or a credit card or something. And that is uh, 
something that's come a long, long way. And uh, so it's, it's, it's doable now. And then the tools are there where before you had to leave uh, Louisiana, leave your small town or whatever, and try to go to Los Angeles and New York to get somebody to work at a record label to hear you perform. And then maybe they would decide to spend you know, a few hundred thousand dollars on you to record you in a rec professional recording studio. And now, you know, Pro Tools means that you can make recordings, you know, um, in your bedroom that you can, that sound just as good as what you, uh, or better than what you hear on the radio. So the tools are there, you know, and, um, and the business has changed so much that it's a lot more democratic in some ways. So um, getting started, the, the hard, the, but the other thing too is that there's so much clutter, there's so much. It's not as simple as it used to be. You make a record, you try to get it on the radio, you get it in a record store, and you go on tour. Now there's cell phones, and you know there's um, there's so many different um, avenues for for um, for um, to exploit music, and in so many different ways. And one and and the one the one way that everybody knew as retail stores that's dying out. And, um, and so what people have to do is maximize their, their thing. One of the things that a lot of hip hop artists do is that they realize that it costs so much money to get played on the radio, it costs so much money to make a record that they uh, can't make any money from their records. So then they go and they try to get endorsement deals with tennis shoe companies or they sell soft drinks or they'll sell, they'll license their name, try to make a name and then license the brand to sell bubble gum or anything they can sell, you know, because there's no money in the music because what they're paying to market themselves and what they're getting is the return is here and what is being spent is up here. And so um, you have to find other ways to try to get revenue. And, uh, and, um, and that's what's happening in the music business. Even if you're a small artist, you know, you, you got, you're trying to sell records in record stores, you're selling them on digital downloads, you sell, you're selling uh, ringtones, you're trying to license things to movies, you're trying to license things to documentaries, independent film, you're trying to get your music heard uh, on uh, MySpace, YouTube, and anything else that somebody might come out with that, that is supposed to be the next hot trend or whatever. You know, there's so many different things there until it's just difficult to, it's still, all these things that we, there's video games, you know, for music. Uh, all these things, and it's still just 24 hours in a day. You know, True. there's not more hours in a day, and people used to be able to sit back and actually listen to an album from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And when the last time anybody's done yeah, that? Yeah, really. You know, I mean, um, so uh, there's so many choices and so much clutter out there. Till it means you have to be even more focused now, and not distracted by the by the bright lights or the, the the, the advertisements for, hey, this is the way, this is the way to do it, come, come this way, walk down this street here, you know, uh, opportunity is waiting for you down, you know, you're getting emails saying just sign up for this and do, there's so much clutter till you really have to just take a deep breath, take a step back and get focused and decide what you want to do, you know, and then you have to follow that and what you want to do might seem like the wildest, I mean, like for me, I'm, I use myself as an example, you know, coming from my background of blues. Hey, man, if you want to, you know, be a movie star or sell millions of records, you know, that's the last thing anybody would advise you to do is that. But it just so happens that when the Hollywood directors wanted something authentic, they needed a guy who can act and who can do this music thing. Well, I was like Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. I mean, how many young black guys from my generation even know how to know anything about the blues, so there was a short list, you know, so I was the odd guy, but then all, all of a sudden I was the right guy because I had a skill that very few people had, you know, so um, it created, it ended up being a hindrance to me early on, but then it ended up creating opportunities. Do you book yourself? Oh, man, no. Who books you? I'm booked by a company called um, BMA. Uh, Blue, Blue Mountain Artists. I have um, I have a publicist, full-time publicist, out of Atlanta. Um, my booking agency out of I think it's South Carolina. Uh, my radio promotion guy, uh, David uh, Fleischman. He's been around for years and used nice to David. Yeah. You know David? Yeah, he's out of Memphis and. Um, 
And uh, that's kind of my, my little team right there for my, for my label. Do you try to put out a record a year, or do you have a schedule whenever it strikes you, or what? This year, I was just lucky to get a record out. My, my latest record's called Rise, uh, and it was about the aftermath of Katrina. And I was just lucky to get that record released because, you know, me and everyone else, was it was so chaotic trying to um, just figure out where you're going to, you know, um, lay your head or whatever. So, um, but no, I mean, for me, I mean, my sales team is in, um, is in Brooklyn. Uh, they call virtual label. They help me between, they go between me and, and the distributor as far as making sure the records are in the stores and all this kinds of stuff here. So uh, it's a big job because, you know, uh, America is such a big country and nobody needs to be popular in America from coast to coast. It just, it's, it, you know, it's not necessary. It hardly ever happens. A lot of East Coast uh, artists, hip hop artists, sell most of their records on the East Coast and they don't sell records on the West Coast and vice versa. And uh, I mean, if you travel around the world, you go to France, there's artists who are like superstars in France. You know, they're, they're royalty in France. Uh, there's Italian artists who sing in Italian. You go there uh, and those guys are, you know, they play arenas, you know, and they're huge artists. And nobody ever heard of them in America and nobody ever heard of them in Germany, you know, but they're huge in, in, in Italy, you know. And there's English bands who just can't make it in America, but you know, you would swear they were the Beatles if you were in, in Leicester Square. So, you know, you don't have to be popular all over the world. You just, cause almost no one is. Um, you just need like uh, your hometown, you know, your state, your region. All you need to do is just find a like, just treat America like a country, like each state like its own country. And just say, these are the, these are the states that you know, I'm going to try to do something in because if you think America as a whole, it's just nobody does that. You know, nobody really is coast to coast, you know. Do you sell or produce other artists besides yourself? I did, and then um, my last distributor, I had to do that because running a label, a lot of times um, distributors, the larger distributors don't want to work with a label that's only going to release one record a year, you know, because um, it's just not, they, they make their money in volume. So if you release 100 records and you sell, you know, one copy of each, you sold 100 records, you know. If you release, release one record and you sell two copies, well, it's still sold more than all those, but you just sold two copies. So, you know, they go by volume. So uh, what I, my first distribution situation, I signed other bands because to, to, to make sure each quarter that I had some kind of release, uh, you know, for the distributor and to keep people working uh, that work with me. And, um, but that was a real strain because when it came time, to, time for me to go out and tour or, or go and do movies or pursue other things, uh, the office kept calling, you know. So uh, the situation I'm in now. I have uh, salespeople in between me and the distributor, and they have these virtual companies that are being created now because a lot of artists are doing it themselves. So what they need is like uh, somebody between them and the, the major distributor. And the person in between them, they, they might have you know 15 artists, a dozen artists or so, which allow the, the single artist labels to work through them and then out to the major distributor. Mm -hmm. And it takes the burden off the artist. It means you can make your record, send it to your distributor, and you can go out and tour and do your promotion or do what you have to do. And you don't have to have a record every, every other week or every quarter or whatever. And that, that situation isn't good for me because it's taking a lot of pressure off mm -hmm. as far as volume. But will I um, uh, you know, release other artists' records? I, I, I don't say no, but I would say at the time that I'm not in the business of doing that at the moment because I'm just, I'm already spread too thin. Do you sell merchandise at your, at your gigs? Yeah. Um, a lot of records these days are being sold um, at, at, uh, at concerts and, you know, on stage. Because a lot of people like to meet the artists and get the autograph. And, you know, people in the blues genre, we've been doing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the more popular artists are starting to catch up to that. So how do you how do you manage all of your time and all the different things at once? That's a great question. It's it's so hard. It's so difficult. Um, you get a, little, a very little sleep. You know, um, 
my nine to five, you know, you get up early and uh, my nine to five is, <clears throat> is doing, I try to get the office stuff done, you know, and try to get out of there, you know, um, three o'clock, four o'clock or so, if I can. And then um, I uh, step away, you know, and, and then later that evening I might go back and try to be creative. Most days I'm too tired to do anything. And that's why I say I go weeks sometime without picking up a guitar or, or anything like that. But right now I'm in, um, you know, if I want a record out by July of next year, it's time for me to start writing that record, to start, you know, thinking about the concepts of it, what's, you know, what story I want to tell, uh, you know, how to get that started. And so for me right now, it means I, I need to go, get, you know, go to the movies, you know, go, uh, you know, find interesting things to read or just be more observant, you know, because I have to try to fall in love with music again, you know, and that's the hardest thing. It's like, you know, I have to fall in love with music, seem like every time lately that I have to go and, and record because it's just background noise to you while you're working in the office or you're driving or you're doing whatever. And uh, then you got to fall in love. For me, I have to fall, you know, passionately in love with music all over again to, to spark the creativity, you know. And uh, it's, really, it's really hard. Uh, hopefully I get to the point where I don't have to go to the office and I can let somebody else run the label. I'm just not large enough um, as a record label to, to, you know, hire someone that would experience full time to actually run the label. So um, I have people that help with different tasks, but I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to just turn, turn that over to someone else. Then I can, uh, you know, spend all night in the studio and sleep all day like I used to. <laughs> uh. Like as an artist, say you make something and it would be good to release it as, or good to do it from a business perspective, but you feel like you shouldn't do it from an artist's perspective or vice versa. How do you deal with that kind of conflict? Yeah, some good questions. Uh, see, I'm, you know, I'm fearless as an artist. At least I used to be, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm a little older now, so, you know, I'm not, um, I don't like, you know, there's no point in me pretending that I'm like, you know, on the cutting edge or anything. I mean, I did pioneer a new style of uh, blues, which was, you know, uh, meant that I couldn't get any work, you know, for a long time because people didn't, didn't, didn't dig what I was doing. But, uh, if I, at that time, I wasn't recording for my own label either, you know, I was recording for the, I was recording for the people. So they saw me as a bit of a problem. But now that I, I, I run my own label, honestly, um, I have to take into consideration what I'm going to release. And, uh, you know, my left brain, my right brain have to kind of wrestle with each other a little bit to, to come up with something that's going to be exciting or, or, you know, adventurous for me and interesting for me as an artist and hopefully for my fans. But hopefully there but there has to be a market for it too. You know, I have to I have to if I'm gonna come up if I'm gonna come up with, with some wild music on other and, and something that people haven't heard or something adventurous or something I'm gonna combine some things that I know is gonna be a marketing issue, then I also have to turn around and come up with the marketing. When they when they, when everybody look at you with a blank look, well how, who do we sell this to? You have to come up with the marketing plan too, you know? So it's, I don't think you can do one without the other if you, uh, you know, running your own label. You know, if you're an artist who's doing your own business, you have to, you know, have, you not only have to create it, but then you have to have an idea of how to present it as well. Okay. So do you find that, that um, your responsibilities as a marketer has, call, have, has changed the way that you, you create music? I don't come up with a marketing concept and then go create the music. No. But I, but it, if once I create the music, I have to come up with a marketing concept. If the music is outside of the the norm, you know, of what of what my fans or what uh, the distributor is expecting, you know, if I come up and do something, um, you know, totally different, then I have to somebody, if not me, I have to find somebody or somebody I have to come up with a way to explain. Because most people, let's face it, most people. You know, I mean, I'm not a person who can tell you why one painting is worth, a, you know, $10 million and one is worth 10. You know, I mean, that's not my thing, you know. Um, I don't, and a lot of people can't tell you why one piece of music is great and the other isn't, you know. Uh, so, 
I think, yeah, you, you know, if you, if you are recording for a major label, well, they got hundreds of people to, to do those things for you. But if you are an independent artist or if you're doing things independently, then you, you got to be, like I said, you know, you, it's more business than it is music, unfortunately. Well, if there were people here that wanted to help you or work for you or be, do things for you, what would you need done? What, um, could you give, what could you give up? Oh, well, that's, that's plenty. I mean, um, so you take some, of the things, some of the things that we're talking about, I mean, uh, the main thing, though, is that, you know, I mean, working, I've worked with, you know, people that have done interns with me before, and I've worked with people before, but, um, you know, I'm not a control freak, per se, but when I record my albums, I do play all the instruments most times. And, I am in the studio, you know, uh, a lot. I spend a lot of time, you know, working alone. But as far as jobs and as far as my record label goes, I mean, somebody in marketing and in sales, those are the kind of things that you always need, you know, uh, some fresh people that are excited about music, that are excited about what, they're, what you're doing, and, and that can convey that to other people, you know, uh, through the phone lines, you know, through. Uh, creating newsletters and things like that to get the word out uh, on press releases and all kinds of things like that. You know, um, somebody that can teach me and keep me keep me informed about the latest trends with the, what's the next MySpace and all that kind of stuff. You know, you know, uh, you know, IT. You know, people. I mean, there's 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 a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of ways somebody could assist could assist us or help us. Do what we do. Where's your company? Where are you located now? We we, we used to be off of Magazine Street, but since Katrina, we moved to Prairieville, Louisiana. But um, like I, like I, when I named other people that work with us, they work, um, you know, in different cities and stuff. So we have like a server and we have a network that a person who works with us just basically log in, and you know, and start doing business like that. Well, if somebody wanted to contact you about that. Can they do that? Sure. My, my website and contact information is at christhomasking.com. That's easy enough. Yeah. Music. What did you do as far as when you approach a film score within the rules of what you do for a film score and retaining the blue style? Well, um, the director dictates, you know, dictates what the score is going to be. Um, I did a, a movie called Animal, which was a contemporary film, and that film, uh, you know, was a pretty violent uh, film, and so, and they wanted some real edgy, you know, industrial, you know, sounding music, so I got out some loops and things that, um, that had that real, you know, crunchy, you know, thumping uh, industrial sound, and I basically played, you know, some slide dobro stuff over that, you know, not dobro, but slide, uh, lap steel, <coughs> guitar, you know, some real wicked, you know, try to make it sound as wicked as I could for the different scenes. And what you do, you know, they'll send you, if they got a rough cut of the film, they'll send you a rough cut of it, and you'll pull that up on your computer, you know, and you'll watch it and you try to put things in it that need to be in there. Things that, and a lot of, um, I, I hate to be tight, I hope people don't typecast me uh, as a, film composed as to, oh, I need some blues, let me call this guy. That's good to have a signature sound or something that you do that people know they can call you and get that from you. That's great. But, um, you know, I feel that, you know, I could score like a Harry Potter film or the next Batman or something if they gave me an opportunity. And I look for those opportunities. And, uh, you know, so, and the thing about Terrence, you know, Terrence seems to, you know, a lot of times directors get their they find their, their team, so to speak, and they usually stick with them. The cinema photographer, you know, uh, the, 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 you know all their assistants. Uh, Terrence is part of the Spike Lee team, so whenever Spike Lee goes to work, Terrence goes to work, and that's great. But, um, you know, Terrence haven't gotten a lot of opportunities to do things outside of the niche that he's, that he's known for, and I know he's eager to, to do that, so, uh, I hope I don't get typecast, but the director is, dictates exactly what it's going to be. Unless the director comes to you and say, we need something like this, or can you come up with something this, that, or the other. 
But um, that's not a, in, in film as a composer, there's not a lot of, usually there's not a lot of creativity uh, there. It's not a, it's not a, unless you've written a film or something, it's really not a lot of creativity. You're, you're hired to, to do, uh, to, cre to create somebody else, else's vision. A couple of things about the music business that I would uh, warn you about. I would tell you the first thing about the music business is that there's no money in it. And so you can't get into the music business to get, you shouldn't get into the music business as a musical artist, or as a musician, to be wealthy, to get wealthy, because it just, it doesn't happen. You know, you have a better shot of, of winning the lottery as having a hit record. It's one thing to have a hit record even. You might have a hit record, but, you know, then it's difficult to actually get paid. This is true. And uh, so it's not that you're not talented or that you won't have a record all over the radio. And that, you know, people won't, people won't uh, want to have your music or dance to your music. But every time you guys download a, um, a download, you know, without paying for it, every time that uh, a record is played on the radio, um, the artist, uh, do you guys know that the person singing don't get paid when it's played on the radio? Uh, do you know that the person, you know, uh, the, the songwriter gets paid but not the, person singing the song. In other words, I gave an example like, um, say, uh, a Whitney Houston, she doesn't write songs, but when she sings a song and it was all over the radio, the songwriters and publishers got paid for that, but the artist doesn't, doesn't get paid for that. And uh, so, um, unless you're the songwriter, the producer, you know, the own the work, you know, all this kind of stuff here, and then, uh, take care of the business side of it to make sure that when it does generate some funds, it comes to you. And that's almost impossible to do because if you're not with a major label, you won't be on the radio. <laughs> so it's like a catch-22 there. So, um, you know, don't get into the music business to, to, um, to you know, for, for uh, wealth because it's very rare that that'll, that'll happen. Um, but get into the music business because you love music. As far as musicians go, get into it because you love music. On the business side of it, I would say anybody who's pursuing it as a business, it is exactly that. It's a business. You have to be on time. You have to be knowledgeable. And you have to uh, do your, at the end of the year, you got to do your, you got to, you know, do your, keep your bookkeeping straight, pay your taxes, do all those things that businesses do, report your income. Always report your income to the IRS. Uh, and I'm very serious about it. If you understand business, you, you form an LLC, and you do it as a, don't do it under your social security name, you know, uh, number, you do it as a, as a business. You form an entity other than yourself. You might form a fictional name as an artist, as a band, and you need to uh, establish an entity and a relationship with banking and investors and, and the business people as a business entity and not as Joe Blow, social security numbers, such and such and such. And uh, if you do that, uh, and the reason why you want to report your taxes is because you can also deduct them. Every time you buy some guitar strings, every time you take some music lessons, your education that you're, that you're getting, you know, all these things are deductible. Your gas to rehearsal, you know, your, your, your vehicle, you know, so you, you, want to tell the, you want to tell the government that, yes, I made some money, but at the same time, you want to tell them I didn't make any money because uh, I had all these expenses, and that's true. That's the way it goes. So you don't, you don't have to try to hide what you're earning. You need to report it because that, uh, that's, that's your resume. I mean, if somebody, like last year, we were fortunate enough to get an investor in my label. My label was almost about to fold up. An investor came and, and invested in my business. Before he invested, he wanted to know what my, how you know my business was doing, so I had to you know send him a profit and loss statement, you know, and he had to see what what we had done and with his investment what we were going to do with that. So it's a business, and if I didn't have rec a good record keeping and things like that, then I never would have gotten to the point where I could get other people involved and get investors, and I never would get major distribution from a label if um, I didn't uh, take care of business because. You know, you have to. Everything has to be accounted for, and unfortunately, that's the whole, that's the cold hard truth. And anybody who gets started in the business, I'll just say this: a guy told me some years ago, um, 
the best advice I think I've ever gotten uh, was a guy that said, it's not the money you make in the business, it's what you do with the money that you make. Because we got lots of New Orleans artists from Mystical and other people that have made a lot of money in the business, and then they don't have anything to show for it, or they're in, in prison, or this, that, and other thing. And so it's not that you can't, it's not that you don't have a talent or you won't be successful, but what you do with the little money that you do get dictates whether or not you're going to be um, successful at, as in, a, in a financial situation. You know, if you if you get the money and you invest it well and you take care of your business, you're going to be successful. And you don't even have to be the most talented person. The person who take care of their business, right. they're going to make it. And they, their music might not be, it might be total crap. But you know, I mean, but they got their business together. So that's usually the bands that succeed, like the Dave Matthews band and people like that. Um, they had a good grassroots business um, network of people working with them, and you can take something like that and, and, and do wonders with it. And then you have other talented artists who die of drug overdoses, or, you know, um, I saw a documentary on Marvin Gaye the other night. I mean, Marvin Gaye, what a sad story, you know, for somebody that was so talented. Sly Stone, Jimi Hendrix, you name it, you know. Um, nobody is doubting talent, but you really, to be successful in the business, you really have to take care of the business. And, um, that's not, that's not uh, exciting and all that, and it's not sexy, but, you know, you have to do that. Well, let's give Chris a big round of applause. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it.